Chapter 21 Second Year Regulus Black Metal Guru, could it be? You're going to bring my baby to me. She'll be wild, you know, a rock and roll child. Remus gripped the handles of his battered old suitcase with white knuckles. His stomach turned excited somersaults as he watched the bustling crowds. Matron had let him run at the barrier this time, though she looked away at the last minute, terrified. Now she was far behind him, on the muggle side of the station, and he didn't have to see her again for ten months. He'd a terrible nightmare the night before that they would arrive at King's Cross and be unable to get through to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. None of it had been real. Magic, wands, wizards, his friends. But Remus tried to push these thoughts from his mind as he gazed eagerly about himself, looking for a familiar face. Let you come back, did they? A cold voice interrupted his search. Standards must really be dropping. Remus felt his shoulders tense. Why did the first person he spoke to have to be Snape? Get lost, Nibblis, he spat. He squared up, turning to face the Slytherin boy with his meanest look. Ugh, what on earth is that smell? Snape drawled, wrinkling his over-large nose. Remus coloured. He stank of antiseptic. He knew it. Matron had been much too liberal that morning. I said get lost, Remus murmured, clenching his teeth and balling up his fists. He saw Severus recoil, slightly. Remus knew how he looked. He'd had two months without magic, surrounded by bigger and tougher boys than Snape. He was wound as tight as a bear trap and ready to throw a punch at the smallest provocation. Oi, Baldy! Another voice sounded over the crowd. A boy with glasses and jet black hair sticking up at all angles was leaning out one of the carriage windows, waving madly at Remus. Remus smiled, forgetting that he was trying to frighten Severus and waved back. He rubbed his head self-consciously. His hair had grown out while he was at Hogwarts, but Matron had shaved it all off as soon as he was back at St. Edmund's, making him look like a thug again. Casting a filthy look at Snape, Remus clutched his suitcase and hurried on to the train, pushing past other students to reach the carriage where his friends were waiting. Lupin! Peter jumped up, excited. He didn't quite know what to do with himself once he was on his feet. They certainly weren't going to hug like girls, and apparently handshakes weren't in order. Pettigrew awkwardly patted him on the arm instead, and Remus gripped his in return. Hiya, lads! Remus smiled, his cheeks aching with happiness as he sat down. How's it been? We should be asking you, James laughed, punching him in the arm. Not one owl all summer. Remus glanced at Sirius furtively. He hadn't mentioned the letter Remus had sent him then. You know, I'm practically a muggle over the holidays, he replied. Couldn't even get into my trunk to do homework. They locked it up. That wasn't strictly true. Remus had asked Matron to lock away his school things, terrified the other boys would get to them. The homework he hadn't done because he hadn't been able to. There was a quiet noise of disgust from the corner. Remus looked up, frowning. Sitting on the seat beside Sirius was another younger boy, with the same deep blue eyes and long dark hair, the same unmistakable black features, full lips and cheekbones that could cut glass. This is Reg, Sirius nodded offhandedly. Say hello, Reggie. It's Regulus. The boy replied irritably, his high aristocratic voice indignant. My darling brother. Sirius raised his eyebrows at the other three. Hi, Regulus, James smiled, offering a friendly hand. I'm James. Hotter. Regulus looked down at his hand as if it were filthy. Sirius slapped him round the head. Stop being such a little prick, he snapped. These are my friends. I didn't want to sit here. Regulus replied. You made me. I'll go on then, piss off. Don't know why I bothered. Regulus stood up, stony-faced, and exited the car, slamming the door behind him. Wow, he really has the black family charm, James grinned. Sirius shook his head despairingly, propping a foot up on the bench opposite and leaning an elbow against the window pane. The whistle blew and the train began to roll out of the station. Shouldn't have expected anything else. Sirius muttered. He's totally brainwashed and annoyed with me. I shouldn't have been gone all summer. Reckon he'll be in Slytherin, then? James sympathised. Probably, Sirius glowered. 
He knows I won't talk to him, if he is. Rather, he was in Hufflepuff. Remus thought this was a bit harsh. Certainly he disliked Snape and Mulciber, and yes, they'd played some pranks on Slytherin House, but Remus had never hated Slytherin, like Sirius seemed to. Surely he wouldn't disown his own brother just because they had a slightly different uniform? The only thing Remus could see wrong with the Slytherins was that most of them were snobs, and Sirius, James, and Peter were snobs too, though they didn't realise it. This train of thought left him as they began to gather speed out of London, and Remus could finally relax into the idea that he was indeed returning to Hogwarts, and that magic was finally, officially permitted. He yanked open his suitcase and grabbed his wand for the first time in months. Remus hadn't dared touch anything magical since the end of term, but now he pulled out one of his second-hand books. They had arrived the week before from Dumbledore, opened it and quickly performed Letiuncula Magna. He pretended he was scratching behind his ear with the wand and muttered the words under his breath. Sirius must have seen what he was doing because he jumped up to pull his broom down from the luggage rack, distracting James and Peter. Remus looked down at the book, his heart racing. The words filled his mind like music, and finally he could read again. The summer had been incredibly dull. He'd attempted to read some of the books lying around St. Edmund's, but without magic it was too frustrating. He'd very slowly got through each of the letters from his friends, but was much too embarrassed to attempt writing back to anyone but Sirius. He'd also had to lie low a lot. Remus felt as though he'd passed whole days sometimes without speaking to anyone. The other boys had been told he'd been away at a private boarding school, paid for by his father's will. This, of course, made him more of a target than ever, and combined with his increasingly difficult full moons, Remus had spent much of the summer covered in bruises. Full moons were another reason he was relieved to be returning to Hogwarts, where Madame Pomfrey, the school's medi-witch, was not only more sympathetic than Matron, but better qualified to handle the peculiarities of his condition. Matron had been horrified to see the new injuries Remus inflicted upon himself each month, and treated him as though he'd done it deliberately, just to annoy her. It had been much worse than the summer before, when he'd got away with a few scratches and bruises each night. Now, underneath his muggle clothes, Remus was almost covered in bandages and plasters which pulled and chafed whenever he moved. He hoped he'd be able to slip off to the hospital wing soon after they arrived. Sirius and James were busy telling Remus about their own summer, with Peter joining in here and there, keen to make it clear that most of the time it had been the three of them. It sounded as though they'd all had a spectacular time, even if there was a lot of Quidditch. James's parents had a cottage by the seaside as well as what James called their usual home near London. The three boys had camped out on the beach, fished, flown kites, and plotted their pranks for the year ahead. They chatted about it excitedly for so long that Remus felt like telling them all to shut up. He felt a bit better when the trolley came round. James and Sirius pulled their pocket money and bought enough to feed half of Gryffindor House. Remus had no complaints. As usual, he was very hungry. Remus was immensely glad that he'd stuffed his face on the train because he'd forgotten how long and drawn out the sorting ceremony was, especially when you weren't taking part in it. Regulus was indeed sorted into Slytherin, which came as a surprise only to Sirius, who Remus heard exhale sharply in disbelief. The younger black brother scurried over to join his peers, and Narcissa, who was now sporting a silver prefect badge as well as a sleek new platinum hairdo. Severus patted Regulus on the back, sneering over at the Gryffindor table. What is his problem? Peter sighed as the food finally appeared. You'd think he'd get over a few stupid pranks. More like he needs to get over Evans, James said, sounding uncharacteristically pensive. They all looked at him in confusion. Oh, come on, it's obvious, he grinned. Old Snivellus is clearly madly in love with a certain carrot-top Gryffindor. He winked at Lily, who gave him a disgusted look, and very obviously turned her back on him to continue her conversation with Marlene. So, because we got the bird he fancies, he's going to be a pain in the arse for the next six years, Sirius replied, disbelieving. Remus blinked at him. Bird? Sirius was not the sort of boy who called girls birds. He was far too upper class. Where on earth had he heard that? Exactly, James confirmed, looking very proud of himself. Nah, Sirius shook his head. No one could care that much about a girl. Remus silently agreed with him. Still, Potter didn't seem to mind having his theories disputed. He shrugged, digging into his roast potatoes. 
If you say so. Must still be annoyed about the time Remus punched him, then. Sirius laughed at that memory, finally cheering up. Chapter 22 Second Year The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars Madame Pomfrey was horrified by the state of Remus's skinny, battered frame when he finally went to see her. What has that woman been doing to you? She gasped angrily. Oh no, I did this all to myself, Remus gestured dryly at his bare chest. The nurse tutted, peeling away another bandage. Yes, but she's done barely anything to treat you. I had no idea muggle medicine was so primitive. These are magical wounds. They need magical care. Remus nodded tiredly. He'd grown used to the carnage now. The pain had settled on his shoulders like a heavy burden, one he thought he would probably just have to bear. Life was full of limitations. He simply had more than others. Perhaps that's why he was so drawn to Sirius and James. Madame Pomfrey wanted to observe him overnight, but he refused grumpily. The full moon was two weeks away, and he wanted to sleep in his own bed as much as possible. He walked back to the common room slowly. Though he was feeling better than he had in a month, Madame Pomfrey had given him a potion that made him feel loose and comfortable and pleasantly light-headed. There was no chance of a quiet afternoon, though, for when Remus reached the dormitory, he found Sirius sitting on his bed, the record player, and brand new album spread across him. Lupin! he beamed excitedly. You have to hear this! Thank Merlin you're here, James groaned from his own bed, where he was flipping through a Quidditch magazine. He's been banging on about that muggle singer all summer. He's not a muggle! Sirius snapped, hands on his hips. He has to be a wizard. He has to be. You should see the clothes he wears. Remus crossed the room and picked up the record sleeve. He smiled, mildly surprised. Oh, Bowie. Yeah, I like him. I don't think he's a wizard, though. Sirius looked mildly disappointed that Remus had heard of him, and Remus hurriedly explained, I've heard Starman a lot on the radio, but no one at St. Eddie's has the album. Placated, Sirius settled the black disc he was holding onto the turntable and fixed the needle in place. James sighed deeply and got up, leaving the room, magazine under his arm. Sirius ignored him, watching Remus's face eagerly as the slow drumbeat began. Remus sat down on the edge of the bed and closed his eyes to listen. Pushing through the market square, so many mothers singing. News had just come over. We had five years left of crying. It wasn't the same as Electric Warrior. It was darker, moodier. Remus liked it a lot. There was a story in it, though he wasn't sure he understood all the parts yet. As the closing bars of Rock and Roll Suicide reverberated, Sirius lifted the needle and moved it back again. Listen to Suffragette City again. That's my favourite. Remus smiled. He could have guessed that. It was loud and rude, and you could dance to it. This mellow-thighed chick just put my spine out of place. For himself, he thought he liked Moonage Daydream best because it was weird and spacey, or Lady Stardust because for some reason it reminded him of Sirius. His long black hair, his animal grace, the boy in the bright blue jeans. Remus quickly dismissed that thought, sure that Sirius would find it hysterically funny. Once they played the album all the way through again and then replayed their favourites, it was almost dinner time. They sat cross-legged together on the bed, poring over the album notes. Maybe he is a wizard, Remus conceded dreamily. He's not like a normal muggle. Told you, Sirius smirked triumphantly. I'm going to get more, too. All of his albums. T-Rex had a new one, Remus said. Slider. Cool. I wish Mrs. Potter had let us leave Diagon Alley. I even got some muggle money from Gringotts. What's Diagon Alley? Remus asked, though he thought he had some idea from the summer letters. Sirius's eyes widened, as they always did when Remus demonstrated his shocking lack of wizard knowledge. Bloody hell, Lupin! He tutted. It's a wizard street in London. Muggles can't get in. It's like... like Hogsmeade. Oh, right. It didn't sound that exciting to Remus. Shopping was boring. Where do you get all your stuff? What stuff? School stuff, your books, your robes. Sirius's eyes darted to the fraying cuffs of Remus's black school robes. 
His own were brand new, immaculately finished and cut slightly better than everyone else's. Second hand, I think, Remus replied. Dumbledore sends them. To know how I'd get to a wizard street, I'm not allowed into London alone. Next summer, Sirius said firmly, you have to come to James's place and stay. We can take you to Diagon Alley. You'll love it. You know I can't, Remus said quietly, not making eye contact. We'll sort it out, Sirius said with confidence. Talk to Dumbledore, McGonagall, the Minister of Magic if we have to. Remus forced a smile, pretending he believed Sirius. Yeah, great. Thanks, Black. The rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars became the soundtrack to the Gryffindor boys' dormitory for the next week, until even James, who was tone-deaf, found himself humming along. Remus had never felt so satisfied and at ease in his entire life. He was away from St. Edmund's, away from grey shirts and matron and locked rooms and troubled boys who wanted to get him. He wasn't covered in bandages, at least for the moment, and until lessons began on Monday, he had all the time he wanted to read, listen to music, and muck about with the marauders. He spent most of his time catching up on his reading and completing the summer homework they'd been set. Like a starving man, he devoured every piece of information presented to him, and even went to get more books from the library to investigate further. He also had to have a number of conversations with James before he could convince them that he had no desire to be on the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Remus was content to sit in the stalls with his book, occasionally glancing up to watch the other three boys flitting back and forth on their brooms. They were all very good, but it was obvious even to Remus that James was the best of the three. He didn't even look like he needed the broom. The black-haired boy soared like a kestrel, his turns smooth, his dives nauseatingly sharp. Remus hadn't attended many Quidditch matches in his first year, but he felt sure that James would earn a place on the team. Sirius was much showier in his flying technique. He didn't lack James's skill so much as his discipline. Black appeared to get bored easily. He could go quite fast when he wanted to, but was more interested in looping and swerving dangerously than catching quaffles or repelling bludgers. He needed James to shout at him every few minutes to keep focused on the game. Peter was very competent after a summer of drills, but he was quite slow over long distances. James decided he might be better off as a keeper. You're acting as if you get to handpick the whole team, Sirius huffed as they headed back to the castle after a practice. They ought to let me, James shrugged as if it were obvious. I'm better than at least half the current team and you're better than both beaters. And I know tactics. Just try not to be too shocked when they don't make you captain, Sirius rolled his eyes. You're still a second year. There weren't supposed to be any second years on the team at all last year. Have some faith, Black, James winked, throwing his arm over his friend's shoulder. They strode ahead together, brooms in hand. The sun was setting behind them and threw everything into sharp relief, outlining the two dark-haired boys in heroic gold. Remus watched them, lagging behind and weighed down by his books, thinking that they would probably all be a little bit surprised if James didn't get exactly what he wanted. Chapter 23 Second Year Brotherhood Remus did not have a brother, at least not one he knew anything about. He supposed that his mother might have remarried and produced a nice non-magic non-monster child. That really didn't feel like his business. He'd accepted his lot in life long ago. James, too, was an only child, and this went at least some way to explaining why he was so cocksure and demanding. Sirius talked about Potter's parents as though they were perfect saints, but they had clearly spoiled their son rotten. Peter had a sister who was a good deal older than him and had already left Hogwarts. She'd been in Hufflepuff, but Peter didn't talk about her very much. She was studying at a muggle university, which was apparently the height of bad taste. So perhaps none of them really understood what was happening between the two black brothers, which might have been why they didn't take it very seriously. It began the morning after the sorting. During breakfast, Regulus had received a gift from his parents, a brand new eagle owl. This was his reward for getting into the right house, which they found out because Severus gleefully read the letter aloud within earshot of the Gryffindor table. Sirius stared at his porridge, not rising to the bait, but Remus looked over at Regulus and saw that he was blushing hard, trying to snatch the letter away from Snape. "'Didn't your parents confiscate your owl again?' Peter asked bluntly, 
Sirius gave a sharp nod. Said I can have it back when I remember my duty to the family and started acting like a true black. I don't care. I don't need an owl. What exactly is your family duty again? James mused loudly so that the cackling Slytherins could hear them. Go round with creeps like Snivellus and Mulciber. Marry your cousin. Sirius finally looked up at James, his expression half grateful, half mischievous. Oh, yeah, he replied conversationally, just as loud as James. Snape, Regulus, and most of the other Slytherins who'd been laughing were now quiet, narrowing their eyes at the two Gryffindor boys. Peter edged away slightly. Inbreeding and creeping are key aspects of my noble heritage. And picking on kids smaller than me, of course. Cheating, lying, cursing my way into power. Well, mate, I'm sorry to break it to you, James replied jovially. But it doesn't sound like you're a black at all. Goodness. Sirius's hand flew to his face in mock surprise. What on earth am I? It's obvious, James shrugged. You're a marauder. Sirius laughed, as did most of the Gryffindors sitting nearby. Remus saw Severus's hand reach for his wand and quickly grabbed his own in preparation, running through a list of spells in his head, trying to come up with one that would stop him the quickest. But Regulus nudged Snape with his elbow, muttering, It's fine. Remus was sure he was the only Gryffindor who heard it. Come on, Snape sneered. We'd better get away from all this filth if we want to keep our breakfast down. This only made Sirius and James laugh harder, and Snape swept from the room, followed by Mulciber and a new first year called Barty Crouch. Regulus held back, glancing nervously between his friends and his brother. The new owl sat perched on his crooked elbow, surveying the scene with an imperious, condescending look. He edged toward Sirius. You can borrow it if you want, Regulus said quietly. I never asked her to send anything, but you know what she's like. Yeah, snorted Sirius. I know. They both looked at each other for a while, and Remus couldn't tell if they were staring each other down or trying to find words to say something different. Look, I'm sorry, okay? You knew I'd end up in slip. Regulus started, but was quickly interrupted by Sirius getting quickly to his feet. I don't need your owl, and I don't want it, he said stiffly, looking right through his brother. If I need to send a letter, I'll borrow James's. With that, he pushed past Regulus and made to leave. James, Remus, and Peter hurriedly got up and followed him. Remus looked back at Regulus, who looked very pale and very cold. Remus didn't think about Regulus very much after that. The line in the sand had been drawn, and it was their duty as marauders to support Sirius. Besides, they were all much too busy once lessons began. Remus threw himself into his studies this time, in a complete reversal of his behaviour the previous September. He read along eagerly, answered questions in class, and completed his homework as soon as it was set. In everything except potions, he was a model student. He'd never forgotten that he had read the year before about people with his problem. They did not do well once they'd left school. Those stupid enough to sign the register were excluded from almost any skilled wizarding work. He would have to be the best of the best, and even that might not be enough, but he had six more years to try. There was another element to his academic aspirations. Sirius. Well, Sirius and James, really, but most importantly, Sirius. Remus didn't doubt that Sirius was his friend, exactly, but he did doubt that Sirius truly saw him as an equal. He railed against the black family's beliefs in blood purity, but at the same time often made snide remarks about Peter's squib heritage. That was always behind Peter's back, and Remus dreaded to think what Sirius was saying about him. Remus had learnt during his very first term at Hogwarts that being a half-blood meant that he was slightly less trusted than other wizards. The Slytherins in particular targeted students with any kind of muggle heritage. Marlene McKinnon, whose father was a muggle, had perfected the bat-bogey hex before anyone else in their year group as a means of defence. Lily Evans was protected from torment wherever Snape was nearby, but it was clear that plenty of the students thought that she was rather full of herself considering the circumstances of her birth. Sirius never voiced anything quite so strong, but Remus had a feeling that his being better than everyone else at schoolwork was taken as proof that his magic was somehow better. Remus had an extremely strong desire to prove him wrong, 
It came as a mild surprise. He'd never been very competitive before, but he'd never been given the tools to compete. Of course, there would always be one insurmountable obstacle for Remus, and in September of 1972, it came towards the end of the month. Remus had been dreading it as always, and in the days beforehand remembered to mention that he wasn't feeling well in order to prepare his roommates for his impending absence. Truthfully, he'd never felt better. Though the transformations had worsened and the days required to recover had lengthened, Remus also found that as the moon began waxing and gathering strength, so did he. He was ravenously hungry, his senses sharper, his magic grew thick and heavy on his tongue like syrup and he barely slept at all, instead staying up half the night reading voraciously, trying to ignore Sirius and James's furtive whispering in the next bed. He arrived at the hospital wing promptly, and Madame Pomfrey and McGonagall once more escorted him down the Whomping Willow. They were very quiet as they made their way across the grounds, but once Remus was locked into the shack for the night, he heard the two women stop and begin talking as they travelled back down the long passageway. They mustn't have realised he could hear them, that his hearing was better than most people's, especially on a full moon night. Madame Pomfrey was complaining about Remus's treatment plan over the summer. Covered in injuries, I cannot in all good conscience allow him to return here, Minerva. It goes against everything I know as a healer. I understand, Poppy. McGonagall responded sharply as they crossed the grounds. It is a difficult matter. When Remus's mother handed him over to the Muggle authorities, she made things very hard. We have to tread carefully, very carefully. I shall speak to Dumbledore. He's such a quiet little thing, never complains, even when he must be in so much pain. Remus didn't hear any more. They'd travelled too far down the passage and his own screams drowned them out. In the morning, Remus came back into his body, gasping as if he'd just been born. There was not an inch of him that didn't hurt. His head throbbed sickly, needles pressed behind his eyes. His neck and shoulders felt like snapped elastic. It hurt to breathe. Every heave of his chest caused pain to shoot through him, and he was sweating heavily, even though the air was cool. There was a deep gash across his belly that made him want to be sick. He'd lost a lot of blood already, and it was still bubbling up wine red. He half crawled, half dragged himself across the room to a box of emergency medical supplies kept under the floorboards. He pulled out some gauze, using all of his remaining energy, and pressed as hard as he could against the dark wound. He cried out from the pain, but kept pressing. His breathing grew shallow, though even that hurt. He felt dizzy, wanted to curl up and sleep. Stay awake, he urged himself furiously. Stay awake or you'll die, you idiot. Die, then. A tiny voice appeared in the back of his head, out of nowhere. It would certainly make things easier. For you. For everyone. Remus shook his head, dazed. The voice was kind and soft, like a mother. He pressed harder, grunting with effort. In his misery, he wondered if the voice was right. Was he clinging on to a life that he'd never really wanted him? That might never be all that much worth living. What if he did die? What if he just closed his eyes? It might just be a matter of sooner rather than later. He closed his eyes, exhaling softly. Remus? Madame Pomfrey's polite knock arrived on time as always. He ignored it. Remus! The door burst open and suddenly she was there, kneeling beside him, pulling his head into her lap. Go away he murmured, not opening his eyes. Let me go. Not on your Nelly, young man, Madame Pomfrey said so fiercely that despite his confused state, Remus laughed. Then he winced, instinctively clutching his chest. The meadow witch aimed her wand at his open wound and stitched it together in a matter of seconds. Then she felt his chest where he'd touched it. Broken rib, she murmured. Poor lamb. She flicked her wand once more, and Remus felt an odd pop in his torso. Suddenly it didn't hurt to breathe any more. He opened his eyes and looked up at her. She was busy tugging a blanket over his shoulders to keep him warm. Now then, she whispered gently, though they were quite alone. What do you think you're doing giving me a scare like that, hmm? Her voice was so warm and her fingers so tender. Very carefully she pulled him into a hug. We can't lose you, Remus. 
Not while I'm at Hogwarts. Hurts, Remus whispered. She held him tighter, and that did it. For the first time in a very long time, Remus began to cry. Not just a few sniffles, either. As the sweet, kind nurse held him, he wrapped his own arms round her soft body and bawled like a baby. He had to spend two full days in the hospital wing. The wound on his stomach was not the only one he'd had inflicted that night, though it was the worst. Madame Pomfrey's spell had been enough to stop the bleeding long enough to get him out of the shack, but he needed rest and quiet. She gave him sleeping draughts regularly, and he drank them down without complaint, preferring not to be awake. The marauders came by trying to see him, but at Remus's request Madame Pomfrey turned them away. It was late Friday morning when she finally let him go. "'I'll send a note to your professors. Let them know not to expect you. You're to go straight to your dormitory and lie down. Understood?' He walked up slowly, taking a different route than usual, thinking about the map. He ought to start working on that again. He'd read something very exciting about something called a homunculus charm. Once he reached the dorm, Remus crawled onto his bed, drew the curtains round it, and lay on his back. Beams of light slid through the joints in the fabric, highlighting a galaxy of dust mites. It was still warm for September, and someone had left the windows thrown open, filling the room with cool air. The breeze sucked the drapes on Remus's bed in, then pushed them billowing out. He watched it dreamily for a while, in and out. It was like being inside a lung. Lupin! A sharp voice shattered his calm. Sirius ripped back the curtains, flooding the small space with light, searing Remus's retinas. Ugh, what? He groaned, shielding his eyes. Sorry. Sirius rubbed his arm nervously. What is it? Remus, I have to tell you something. They were quiet for a few long moments. Remus slouched back, too tired to sit up. He sighed. Well? It's James, Sirius said desperately. He... he wants to talk to you. What? It's... Ah, blimey, it's hard to say, Lupin. What are you on about? He knows, James knows, and he wants us to confront you. Remus sat up his stomach flipping over. He... he knows... he knows what? About your, um... you know, where you go every full moon. Dreamer stared at Sirius. He didn't know what to do. You knew? I knew, Sirius confirmed. How long? Since last Christmas. I... I, I didn't want to say anything... I didn't want to make it harder for you. Remus was speechless. Sirius shook his head, impatient. But James worked it out too, the lanky idiot. Now he's decided we all need to confront you about it. I'm really sorry, I tried to get him off it, but you know how pig-headed he is. Yeah, Remus croaked, leaning forward rather suddenly. He held his hand in his hands. That was it. He was about to lose everything. Everything that meant anything to him. It's okay. I think it's going to be okay, Sirius said. How? Remus lifted his head, hot with terror. Might as well start packing now. No, don't. Look, he wants to talk to you about it. He's not going to go straight to Dumbledore. Doesn't that mean something? But Remus had already got up, opened his trunk and begun emptying things into it. He might have to leave straight away. They might not even give him time to pack. Would they let him keep his wand? He'd grown very fond of it, and it had belonged to his father, so it was rightfully his. Perhaps if he promised only to ever do the reading spell with it? Remus! Sirius grabbed his shoulders. He flinched, but only because he expected it to hurt. Sirius's dark blue eyes bored into him, and he tried to look away. Listen to me, Black said very gently. Just wait, okay? Just wait and see what James says. He's your friend. We're marauders. Thus. That's bollocks, Remus shoved him away. That's complete bollocks. You two are the marauders, you and him. Me and Peter are just your pet charity cases. He seized his pyjamas from the end of the bed and flung them into his trunk. I'm not that much of an idiot, Black. I'm probably better off going back where I belong. 
It was the first time Sirius had ever been speechless. But then, it was the first time Remus had ever said so much to him. His mouth twitched once or twice as though he wanted to speak but couldn't quite manage it. Remus kept packing. Just wait, Sirius said hoarsely, leaving the room. Just wait and see what he says. Chapter 24 Second Year Potions Again Despite all his talk, Remus did wait. He couldn't see that he had many options other than to go directly to Dumbledore and ask to be sent back to St. Edmund's, and he wasn't exactly sure where Dumbledore's office was. He hadn't got that far with the map. The map? He'd better leave that behind. Sirius and James could finish it. At least he wasn't tired anymore. He sat on his trunk, fidgeting for what felt like hours. Thought about going down for lunch, but what if they wanted to talk to him right there in front of everyone? He stayed put. He wasn't hungry anyway. He tried to read, but couldn't concentrate long enough. Every so often, Remus's mind wandered back to his conversation, argument, with Sirius. He wasn't sure how he felt about it. On the one hand, once the initial terror had passed, he could see that Sirius was trying to be kind. If he really had known since last Christmas, then he probably had no intention of telling anyone else. And he'd given Remus fair warning, at least. But on the other hand, what Remus had said was true. Just because James was Sirius's best friend didn't mean that he would have any protective feelings towards Remus. They were friends, certainly, but only because they were dorm mates. Remus couldn't play Quidditch, wasn't from a good family, had no money. On top of that, would Potter's perfect reputation allow him to associate himself with a dark creature? As for Sirius, Sirius couldn't even forgive his own brother for being in a different house. If family didn't matter to him, why would friendship? Just after the four o'clock bell rang, Remus heard three sets of footsteps tramping up the stairs. He stood up, bracing himself. James entered first, looking very serious and somehow older than all of them. Sirius came in behind him, his expression inscrutable, no trace of the emotion from earlier. Peter was last, looking, as usual, very uncomfortable and out of his depth. "'Hi, Remus,' James said straight away. They all stood facing each other, the room feeling very small, even with the window open. "'Hi,' Remus replied, trying to keep his eyes on all three of them at once. "'How are you feeling?' "'Fine.' Look, mate, I'll get right to it, okay? James ran his fingers through his hair, swallowing nervously. Remus could see his Atom's apple working. We've noticed... Well, we couldn't not notice that you're away a lot in the hospital wing. Every month, pretty much. Peter was nodding sycophantically behind him, and Remus felt a sudden surge of hatred rise up out of nowhere. He repressed it, focusing instead on meeting James's eyes. They already thought he was a wild animal. Better not confirm it. Okay, he said sullenly. Yeah, James nodded as if they were having a perfectly normal conversation. Every month, around the full moon. He let it hang there in the air. Remus grew impatient to get it over with. Just say it, James. Are you a werewolf? It came out all in a rush, and James's gaze finally dropped as though he were embarrassed to have asked. Remus glanced at Sirius, who was still staring at him with a look of determination. Peter was gnawing his bottom lip, his eyes darting between Remus and James. Remus squared his shoulders. Yeah. He jutted his chin forward, as if daring James to strike him. Whatever. He was ready for it. James exhaled. Right. That it? Yes. I, I mean, no. I mean, bloody hell. James ran his fingers through his hair again, turning to the others for support, looking helpless. It's okay, Remus said, his voice hard. I'm off. Just let me go and tell McGonagall. Off? Off where? Back to St. Edmund's, I suppose. As if there were anywhere else. You can't leave Hogwarts! James looked even more worried now. His glasses had slid down his nose and he hadn't even noticed. I can't stay if everyone knows, Remus explained as calmly as he could. We won't tell anyone, Peter squeaked suddenly. Remus looked at him in surprise, then at Sirius, then at James. James was nodding now. We won't, he confirmed. 
Remus shook his head, not allowing himself to entertain the idea, to even hope. Hope never got you anywhere if he knew anything. He knew that. It was a rule written on his skin in thick silver lines. This isn't a game. Keep the secret or whatever. If other people find out, I will have to leave. It could be worse than that. They might... He didn't say it. What was the use in saying it? We won't let it happen. Sirius finally spoke, stepping tentatively forward. Will we? He turned to Peter and James, either side of him. They both looked very serious and very frightened, but they both shook their heads firmly. Trust us, said James. Please? He agreed to give them a month, or they agreed to give him a month. He wasn't sure. It wasn't clear who thought who was more dangerous. It was agony at first, every moment filled with awkwardness and a new kind of shyness that hadn't been there before. They think I'm a monster, a voice in Remus's head chanted over and over. They think I'm going to murder them in their beds. They think I'm evil. And really, when he thought about it, nothing yet had proved that he wasn't. It had been clear for some time that his affliction was subject to change as he grew into adolescence. Remus had no idea how far it would go. Perhaps one day he would cross that line. Perhaps that was simply the way of things. For a whole week, they didn't talk about it. Not a word. Not even a whisper. Remus had felt sure they would all badger him with questions. Sirius especially, but he'd evidently been so severe with them when the confrontation happened that no one wanted to bring it up again. In front of everyone else, they acted the same. James was loud and overconfident. Sirius was witty and arrogant. Peter adoring and insecure. But when they were alone together, the four of them were quiet, thoughtful, and too polite. Sirius and James's nightly conferences became more frequent. Unexpectedly, but perhaps unsurprisingly, it was Severus Snape who ended up reuniting the marauders. It was, of course, during a potions class. This term they were embarking upon pleasant dream potions, which would take some weeks to brew. You need to come back regularly in the evenings to check on your potions' progress. I shall be marking you on persistence and attentiveness. To that end, I think it's best if you all pair up so that you can take it in turns. Slughorn announced. There was a general flurry and chatter as students began to pick their partners. Remus resigned himself to sharing with Peter as usual, but above all the commotion, Slughorn raised his voice again. No, no, I've learned my lesson. He gave the marauders a severe look. You may not choose the same partners you had last year. Sirius and James looked at each other, then at Peter and Remus, sizing them up. Remus cringed. In fact... Slughorn continued. I think I shall assign the partners. Fortunately, Slughorn was tactful enough not to put any of them with Snape, though Peter ended up with Mulciber and towered over him twice his size. The professor split up Mary and Marlene, who were as joined at the hip as James and Sirius, placing them with the boys. I'm not Sirius, Mary squealed. Marlene nudged her and they dissolved into giggles. Sirius looked horrified. James looked put out. He ran his hands through his hair and straightened his back slightly. Remus was asked to pair up with Lily Evans, much to his disgust. He didn't really like any of the girls, but he wanted to work with Lily least of all. She was nosy and tried too hard to be nice. Plus she was best friends with Snape, who was now staring daggers at him from across the room. Remus could not forget the incident during first year in which Lily had stopped Snape and Mulciber from attacking him and her general disdain for his friends. In fact, every encounter he'd had so far with Lily turned out relatively unpleasant for Remus. She seemed to recognise his dislike and smiled at him nervously. Hi, Remus. Are you feeling better? She squeaked. He grunted in response, head down. Better keep well back, Lily. Snape hissed from the desk he was sharing with the Slytherin girl. Loony Lupin might be contagious. Shut it, Snivellus, Remus muttered in response, trying not to let Slughorn hear. Yes, please be quiet, Sev, Lily said primly, giving him a hard look. Only trying to help, the greasy boy replied, lips curling. We don't want anyone else coming down with Lupin's mysterious ailment, do we? Let me know if you need anything, Lily. Remus and I are quite capable of completing the assignment ourselves, thank you.
she snapped, tossing her mane of red curls and opening her textbook with an elaborate flourish. She looked at Remus. We need eight rat tails finely diced. Do you want to do that or shall I? Oh, uh, I'll, I'll do it, Remus replied, taken aback. Good, I'll start weighing the rosemary leaves then. They worked quietly for a while and it might have been all right if they were at another desk but Snape was close behind them the whole time, casting spiteful glances at Remus and speaking just above a murmur. Of course, Loony Lupin is quite apt, he said to the girl he was working with, because he really is utterly mad. I've seen him wandering around the castle on his own, lurking in dark corners. You may recall he actually attacked me last year. He's clearly dangerous. I don't know why Dumbledore allows this. Remus felt his ears turning red. He turned round, holding out his wand. Say one more word, he growled. Snake looked him up and down, smirking. Lily grabbed Remus's arm and pulled him back. Just ignore him, she whispered, though she sounded very annoyed herself. He's having a bad time at home and he blames it on everyone else, that's all. Fine. Remus said, returning to his rat's tails. The blood stained his fingers. Once they prepped their ingredients, it came time to stir. Remus was starting to get along quite well with Lily now. She was patient and didn't act like she knew everything, like James and Sirius. She was a bit of a goody two-shoes, but he remembered that he was trying to be one too, so he'd better learn to like it. I'll stir, he said heroically. He'd never offered to do something for a girl before, hadn't so much as held a door open, his contact with the fairer sex had been so limited. It felt very grown-up and James-like. He rolled up his sleeves and grabbed the large wooden spoon. Ugh! Look at him! Snape's nasty, clawing voice rang out loud enough for half the class to hear. Remus looked up and found that everyone was looking at him, at his bare arms. He hurriedly yanked his robes down to cover the marks, but they'd all seen. What sort of disease is that?! Shut up, Severus, Lily barked. Why do you have to be so horrid? Lily, just look. Mind your own business. Remus's mind was racing. He wished the ground would swallow him up. He wished he could crawl under the desk. He wished he knew how to apparate. He'd give anything to throw another punch at Snape. The marauders had heard too. Sirius and James raised their head from their cauldrons. Boy. Snivellus, what are you saying about our mate? Oh, you stay out of this, Potter! Lily groaned. You'll only make it worse. Silence, please! Slughorn boomed. You're not first years anymore. I should think you'd be able to concentrate on the task at hand. Everyone fell quiet. Remus was gripping the stirrer with all his might. I'm so sorry, Remus, Lily whispered, looking genuinely upset. He's such a... Oh, I don't know. Look, I've got these. She held out her hand covertly. Remus looked down. She held two greyish round things that looked like bullets or tablets. What? he asked gormlessly. He was annoying me last week, showing off about how good he is at potions. I know it's petty of me, but I wanted to teach him a lesson, so I made these. Then he had this thing with his mum, and I felt sorry for him, so I didn't use them. But now... Evans, Remus said, exasperated. What are they? Just something I've been playing round with in Slug Club. Lily smiled enigmatically. Remus noticed that she was actually strikingly pretty. They'll react with his potion. It'll be really good. He stared at her, awestruck. But you're such a... Teacher's pet? Swat? Goody-goody? She smiled wider, showing all of her neat white teeth. Some of us know how not to get caught, Mr. Marauder. She shook his head, bemused. Here, she shoved the pills into his hand. You do it. Toss them in when he's not looking. Oi, Potter! She shouted across the room. James's head snapped up, his glasses foggy from the steam emanating from his cauldron. Huh. Snape had looked up too and was glaring at James. Remus moved quickly, pretending to yawn and stretching his arms out. His right hand just reached over Snape's cauldron. He dropped in the pills, just as Lily said. Oh, nothing, she said sweetly, before turning back to her work. Both Snape and James stared at her in confusion. <laughs>
Remus was impressed. His admiration only grew as she grabbed Remus's arm, yanked him back as Snape's cauldron exploded behind them, a magnificent mass of foaming purple bubbles spilling over the brim, all over Severus and his partner's clothes. The whole class began to laugh, and Snape turned white with rage, his nostrils flaring. Oh dear, Slughorn bustled over. A bit over-eager with the beetle husks, eh, Severus? It wasn't me. Snape fumed, purple bubbles settling in his hair. He did something. He pointed at Remus, who winced. He must have. Did you see Mr. Lupin tamper with your potion? No, but... Come now, boy, Slughorn laughed, throwing him a green tea towel. We all make mistakes, even you. Severus spluttered incoherently, and Lily was clearly struggling to keep a straight face, eventually having to turn round, her shoulders shaking in silent hysterics. After the lesson, the marauders piled on Remus in the hallway, whooping and cheering. You did it, didn't you? Brilliant! How did you do it? You're crap at potions! Remus grinned back at them, neither confirming nor denying. Over James's shoulder, he saw Lily flash him a quick smile before hurrying up the stairs. Didn't I tell you? Sirius proclaimed brightly, throwing an arm round James and another round Remus. He's still a marauder. Chapter 25. Second Year. After Hours. Friday, 6th of September, 1972. Once the initial ice had been broken, the questions came flooding in. That evening, after dinner, all four boys sat on Remus's bed. When did it happen? Does Dumbledore know? Have you, you know, attacked anyone? What's it like? Where do you go when it happens? Remus gnawed his bottom lip. He'd never talked about his condition before. Not to anyone, except for his conversation with Madame Pomfrey last year. None of the muggles he'd grown up with would have believed him, and he'd been led to believe that wizards would shun him. Um, he tried to work out where to start. I was five years old when it happened. I don't really remember much before that. Yeah, Dumbledore knows. I don't think I've ever hurt anyone. I think I'd know if I did. So, when you turn, you can remember what it's like? Sirius asked eagerly. Being a wolf? Um, not really? Remus thought hard. Maybe I can remember feeling stuff, but I don't think I have a human brain while I'm like that. It's more like a really bad dream. I always thought werewolves were more. Peter looked at him thoughtfully. I don't know. Scary? Remus shrugged. So is that what happened to your dad? Sirius asked abruptly. Did he get killed by the werewolf that bit you? Remus flinched, not because of his father, but because he wasn't used to hearing the W word so much. He never said it himself. No, he replied. My dad, he, um, well, he killed himself. After I was bitten, so I suppose it was because of me. My mother, you know, she's a muggle. I think it was probably a bit much for her, so she packed me off to St. Edmund's. There was an uncomfortable sort of silence. Have you ever met? Sirius began, but James gave him a sharp look. That's enough, Black. Leave him alone. They eventually split off to do their homework, and James went for a run round the grounds before it got dark. Quidditch trials were coming up, and he was becoming more obsessed with fitness and endurance by the day. He tried to get Peter and Sirius to go with him, but they begged off. Bloody slave driver! Peter muttered as he left. I've told him I'm not trying out. I think I probably will, Sirius said casually. They need a beater anyway. Homework was eventually cast aside in favour of a particularly aggressive game of exploding snap between the three of them, with a record spinning on its needle, the Beatles, because Peter pleaded for a break from Bowie. Later, after lights out, Remus sat up reading a book Sirius had lent him. It was a muggle paperback, science fiction. He'd seen a few films like it at the local cinema back at St. Edmund's, but he didn't know there were books, too. It was just getting exciting when he heard the telltale creak of the floorboards that meant Sirius was paying James a visit. 
She heard the curtains rustle in low whispering before a sudden unnatural void of sound which meant someone had cast a silencing spell. Dreamus ignored it, scrunching down into his duvet and focusing on his book. It was perhaps twenty minutes later than he heard the silencing spell being recalled. It was as though he'd been deaf in one ear and can suddenly hear again. He listened to the curtains rustle again as Sirius climbed back and padded softly across the room. This time, however, his footsteps came closer and much to Remus's surprise, his own bed curtains cracked open. Sirius's long, pale face peered in on him. Hiya. Hi, Remus replied. What's up? Saw your wand light. He nodded. Can I come in? Um, okay. Sirius grinned and slipped inside easily, kneeling on the bed in front of Remus, who drew his legs up to his chest, setting his book aside. Sonoro quiesis, Sirius whispered, casting the soundproofing charm so that they would not disturb the others. How's the book? Good, Remus replied non-committally. What's up? he repeated. I was just talking to James, he said, settling down, sitting cross-legged. He reckons I've upset you, asking questions about your dad. Oh, Remus cocked his head, surprised. No, I'm okay. It doesn't upset me. I'm used to it. That's what I told James. Right. Sirius didn't leave, just kept looking at Remus. It was making him uncomfortable. He was only wearing a thin vest to sleep in, which displayed a number of red and silver marks crisscrossing his bare arms and shoulders. Sirius stared openly. How did you get those scars? He asked quietly. Remus frowned, pulling the bedsheets up to his neck. How did you get yours? He snapped. He instantly regretted it. Sirius stopped gazing at his skin and recoiled, eyes full of hurt and surprise. Ah, uh, from my parents. The Lacero curse. It's how they discipline us, he said, his voice a little robotic. Sorry. Remus dropped the duvet. He sighed, extended his arm so that Sirius could see better. I do them to myself when I'm... when I change, see? He pulled down one shoulder of his vest and twisted slightly to show him four long white claw marks. Wow! Sirius breathed on his knees again, leaning toward it with his lit wand to get a better look. Why do you do it? I don't know. I'm not exactly myself. Madame Pomfrey reckons it's frustration, because it's in my nature to attack people and I don't have anyone to attack. Where do they put you? There's this old house... McGonagall and Pomfrey take me there every month. There's a passageway under the Whomping Willow. Does McGonagall watch you? No, it's too dangerous. I think they use spells to keep me locked in. Sounds horrible. Remus shrugged. No, nah, it's not as bad as back at St. Eddie's. They have a cell for me there with a silver door. When I first got there, Matron thinks I was too little to remember, but they put me in a cage. Sirius looked up at him sharply. That's disgusting! I don't know. Sirius was surprised by his reaction. It was to keep everyone else safe, and I can have only been the size of a puppy. Cub, Sirius said promptly. Huh? A baby wolf is a cub. Dogs are puppies. So where did you get bitten? Sirius had swapped concern for curiosity once more. Oh, um, here. Remus patted his left side just above his hip. Sirius looked at him expectantly. Remus sighed again. Do you want to see? Sirius nodded eagerly, leaning forward again as Remus lifted his shirt at the hem. He barely noticed the bite mark any more, though it stood out as much as it ever did. It was a huge scar, evidence of an unbelievably large jaw. You could count every tooth, if you were so inclined, the deep dimples marring Remus's soft skin. Sirius got very close now, so that Remus had to lean all the way back to stop their heads from bumping. Oh, wow, he breathed, lost in his observation like someone who'd unearthed a great archaeological treasure. Remus felt Sirius's long hair brush his skin and the warmth of his breath and pushed him away quickly. God, Black, you're so weird. Sirius just grinned that serious Black grin. Friday, 13th of October, 1972. So what exactly are we doing here? James whispered, sounding amused. And why did you have to bring that stupid cloak? 
Sirius said, slightly muffled under the fabric. It's ours until curfew. I'm hot, Peter complained. Shut up, all of you, Remus commanded. I'm trying to concentrate. Concentrate on what? Ow! Remus kicked Sirius in the shin. I said shut up. Bloody okay, Sirius muttered, but he was quiet after that. Remus sniffed. Definitely smelt like chocolate. The whole corridor. Only a faint whiff as you turn the corner, but richer and sweeter the further you walk toward a statue near the middle. The scent had been driving Remus mad for weeks, since he noticed it late last term. It had to have something to do with the statue. A witch with a hunched back and an eye patch. It was a horrible portrait. He hoped that the artist had just been particularly unkind and the poor woman hadn't really looked like that. Have you brought us here to meet your new girlfriend, Lupin? James asked, smirking as Remus continued to stare at the one-eyed witch. Why do you keep sniffing like that? Remus whined. Sirius whined. I don't want to be this close to you if you're going to get a cold. Can't any of you smell that? Smell what? Chocolate. Definitely chocolate. Chocolate? Where? Peter suddenly perked up. I can't smell anything, Sirius said. Me neither, said James. It's coming from the statue, Remus continued, unperturbed by his friend's teasing. He reached out and touched the stone carefully through the cloak. What, reckon the old Bint's hump is packed with sweets or something? Sirius was starting to sound bored and irritable. It bothered Remus a little bit sometimes. He and Peter got dragged along on all sorts of stupid missions by the other two, but if he and James weren't in charge, then Sirius always acted up. No, Remus said. I reckon it's one of those secret passages from that book of yours. Really? Now Sirius was paying attention. Can you actually smell chocolate? Is that some special thing you can do? Yeah. It doesn't lead to the kitchens, Peter said knowledgeably. They're on the ground floor, a Hufflepuff told me. How can we get in? Password, James suggested. Like the common room? Scallywag! Peter shouted at the witch eagerly. Nothing happened. I didn't mean it would be the exact same password, Peter, James said. He was being kind, but Sirius and Remus were already in fits of laughter. What about Alohomora? Sirius suggested, recovering. Remus tried it, but nothing happened. That's for locks anyway, James said. Isn't it something else for revealing unseen entryways? Oh, yeah! Sirius nodded, getting excited. Yeah, there is. Um, Descendium! He tapped his wand on the witch's hump. Immediately, the hump opened, sliding away, leaving a gap easily enough for all of them to file inside, one at a time. The smell of chocolate grew even stronger, and now Remus could also smell earth, fresh air, and other people. They lost no time slipping inside, and the hump closed behind them. Lumos! they all said in unison, throwing off the cloak. James folded it up under his arm and immediately assumed leadership. Come on, he said, holding his wand ahead of them, lighting up the dark passage. Let's go! They all followed. Remus didn't mind. He'd done his bit. It was a long walk, down a flight of cold stone stairs, through a tunnel that was earthy and damp, but the scent grew stronger and when they finally reached the end, there was another staircase leading to a wooden trap door. They looked at each other and silently agreed that James should go first, they watched him ascend, push open the door and poke his head through. Remus felt they were all holding their breath, watching James's torso disappear up into the unknown. I don't believe it, he laughed above them. You've got to see! He hauled himself upward, vanishing altogether. Sirius scurried up after him, not wanting to miss anything. Remus went next, but Peter dithered behind them. Where are we? Sirius was asking, staring around at the dark little room. They were surrounded by neatly stacked boxes and crates. The smell of confectionery was now overwhelming. I think we're actually in Hogsmeade, James said excitedly. This is the storeroom at Honeydukes. The sweet shop? Remus asked, though it was pretty redundant at this point. Sirius had ripped open a box which looked to contain at least 500 boxes of chocolate frogs. Remus had heard all about Hogsmeade from the other boys. They'd all visited on family holidays before. It was one of the only entirely magical villages in Britain. 
Older students were allowed to go on the weekends and often brought back paper bags bulging with sweets from Honeydukes. Standing in the cellar at that moment, Remus could not have been happier with the outcome of his mission. They finally co- <clears throat> They finally coaxed Peter up and spent a good hour exploring the shop, marvelling at their own brilliance. They chose a little bit of everything, with Remus directing them as the only one with any kind of shoplifting experience. James thought Remus didn't see him slip a bag of sickles and galleons from his robes and leave them on the counter as they were all leaving. The marauders returned to the Gryffindor common room with their pockets heavy and huge grins on their faces. A prefect took points from all of them for missing curfew, but they could care less. When they all lay in bed hours later, pretending not to have stomach aches, Sirius called out, That's definitely going on the map. Chapter 26, Second Year, Quidditch I've had enough, Peter said grimly. Remus sighed next to him. He knew the feeling, but there wasn't much point in whinging about it now. I really have, Peter reiterated, his voice slightly high as he looked up at Remus for validation. I know you have, Remus replied, hoping to placate him. They've dragged us into all sorts of stuff, got us detentions, and I never complained. Well, you did a bit, Remus raised an eyebrow. Peter nodded. Okay, I did sometimes, but I always did as James said, serious, even though he's horrible to me. Sirius is horrible to everyone, Remus said, getting bored now. Well, this time I've definitely had enough, Peter continued. They've gone too far. We're just being supportive, Remus yawned, leaning forward on the wooden spectator stands. Thought you liked being supportive. Not, Peter grimaced. At five o'clock in the morning. Remus was inclined to agree, even if he wasn't going to whinge about it. At least Peter actually liked Quidditch. They looked out on the quiet pitch, grass thick and green under a gauzy veil of early morning mist. James and Sirius were presumably still in the changing rooms with the rest of the Gryffindor Quidditch team hopefuls. Remus and Peter were both huddled in the stands, wrapped in their scarves and hats, waiting for the trials to begin. They'd been there for at least an hour already, too early even for breakfast because James had wanted to practice beforehand. They might have said no and slept in instead, letting the other two go early if they wanted. But Peter was right. They always did as James said. He was just too good at convincing them. Remus yawned again. Oh, hello, Remus. Lily Evans came up the stairs, smiling at them tiredly. Hi, Peter. Morning, Remus nodded back. No, oh, Lily. Peter yawned. Chilly, isn't it? Here to watch the Quidditch trials? Yup. Should have known James would be having a go, Lily said wearily. James's Quidditch fanaticism was not restricted to the Marauder's dorm room. Everyone who'd ever met him knew how keen he was. Serious too, Remus said. Well, never one without the other, Lily replied primly. Who are you watching? Peter asked. Marlene, Lily pointed at the end of the pitch where the Gryffindor team and new applicants were gathering by the goalposts. Remus could just make out Marlene McKinnon's pale blonde ponytail. She's going for Beta. That's the position, sit. Peter started, but Remus kicked him quickly in the leg. Lily looked at them bemused and opted to change the subject. Remus, can you check on the pleasant dream potion tonight? I'm really behind on my astronomy and I wanted to talk to Professor Astor. Can't, Remus replied, leaning forward on his elbows. We've got detention. Oh, for what? Levitating all the tables and chairs in the defence against the dark arts classroom, Peter supplied. Really? Lily looked surprised. I didn't hear about that. We haven't done it yet, Remus said. We're going to later while everyone's at lunch, but I expect they'll know it was us and we'll get the detention anyway. Lily tutted. What did I say about getting caught, Lupin? She grinned impishly. Remus shrugged, giving her a small smile back. Lily really wasn't that bad. She had that gift all girls had for making you look stupid, but at least she had a sense of humour about it. It was particularly pleasant to see her without Snape, who usually loomed nearby like a vampire bat, reeking of gloom and disapproval. There was finally movement on the Quidditch pitch as all of the hopefuls were put through their paces. James could not fail to impress. He was on top form that day, 
He swooped and dived and twisted in mid-air as if it were nothing, as if he was swimming, not flying. Remus heard Lily's sharp intake of breath as James attempted a particularly tight turn. "'Does he have to show off like that?' she asked nervously. "'He'll get himself killed.' "'He won't,' Peter said. "'I've known him since we were five years old, and he've never even fallen off his broom. Not once!' "'No wonder he thinks he's untouchable,' Lily muttered. The rest of the would-be chasers took their turns, but it was obvious that James was the best choice. Next it was the beaters. Sirius, Marlene, and a burly fifth year were handed their bats and took to the sky along with six bludgers. It was horrible to watch. Remus's nerves were set on edge as the brutal red cannonballs shot towards his friend's head and body. Sirius deftly avoided the bludgers and knocked a few out of the way, but Marlene was unstoppable. She flew circles round her competition, swinging her bat with machine precision and sending the bludgers flying across the pitch every time. "'Bloody hell!' Peter exclaimed. "'Didn't know McKinnon had it in her!' "'Her brother plays for the cannons,' Lily explained, looking smug on Marlene's behalf. "'She's been training with him all summer.' "'Sirius has been too,' Peter said, defending his friend, all previous slights forgotten. "'He and James were at it constantly, weren't they, Remus?' Remus didn't reply, even to remind Peter that he'd not spent the summer with them. He was too busy being embarrassed for Sirius and wishing Marlene McKinnon didn't have to be so bloody good at whacking bludgers, or at least wishing there were two positions open for Beta. He wasn't sure why he cared so much. He hated Quidditch. And if Sirius and James were both on the team, then it meant he'd have to spend a lot more time shivering in the stands. And he'd been secretly waiting for Sirius to fail at something for ages, waiting for proof that Sirius Black wasn't utterly perfect in every way. But now that the moment was here, Remus felt guilty for thinking of it. Sirius was sure to be crestfallen. "'Here they come!' Lily jumped up and ran down the steps to meet her friend. Remus and Peter followed her slowly. "'I got in!' Marlene was grinning, her face pink with pleasure. She and Lily hugged. James looked incredibly pleased with himself too, his hair sticking up wildly from the wind, his glasses slightly askew. Still, he wasn't smiling as much as Marlene, obviously trying to subdue himself for Sirius's sake. Sirius had a face like thunder. Peter actually took a step back at the sight of him. "'Yeah, well done, McKinnon,' Sirius said gruffly, looking at the ground. "'Thanks. Um, you were good too, Sirius?' she said nervously. He grunted, still not looking up. James looked at him sideways and made an apologetic face at the girls. He extended his hand to Marlene. See you next week for first practice. Yeah, great. She smiled at him brightly. See you, Potter. The two girls set off back to the castle, arm in arm, chattering away excitedly. Serious, mate, it's not the end of the world. James turned to his friend, looking concerned. I know. Sirius kicked a tuft of grass. You could have been on the reserve team if you wanted. Singh did offer. I know. I don't want to be on the bench. Shall we go for breakfast? James sighed finally, looking at the other two for support. Peter nodded enthusiastically. Remus couldn't help but feel a little annoyed. This was all Potter had talked about since they started at Hogwarts, and Sirius didn't even have the decency to be happy for his best friend. Well done, James. Remus said, rather pointedly, looking at Sirius as he said it. You were amazing. Congratulations. Thanks, Lupin. James grinned. His eyes crinkled slightly when he smiled, and his face lit up, as if that was his face's natural state. Yeah! Peter punched him on the arm. Nice one, Potter. Thanks! They walked back to the castle together quietly. Sirius still wasn't speaking, and he was walking a few steps ahead of the rest of them. James jogged to keep up. You can try again next year. Ardle have left by then. He told me he was dropping out to focus on his NEWTs. It's fine. I don't care, Sirius replied, shrugging him off. He walked even faster, quickly getting away from them, broom still under his arm. James went to catch up, but Remus grabbed his arm. Leave him, he said angrily. Let him go if he wants to be a moody get about it. Sirius didn't join them for breakfast, nor was he in the common room afterward. James was waylaid by most of the other Gryffindors, who by now had heard from the team that he was the new chaser. A gang of fourth-year boys pulled him over to talk strategy, and Peter went too, basking in his friend's glory. That never mattered with James. He always had plenty of shine to share.
Remus was not a fan of the spotlight and took the opportunity to look for Sirius. He wasn't in their dorm, but that was expected. Clearly, Black wanted to mope somewhere in private. But Remus wrote the book on hiding places, and it wasn't long before he found him, curled up in an enclave hidden behind a tapestry depicting a unicorn hunt. Go away, Lupin, Sirius scowled, turning away, arms round his knees. His voice was thick as though he'd been crying, though his face was dry. You can't shimmy up, okay? Remus rolled his eyes, clambering into the enclave with him, forcing him to move. Budge up, he said firmly. I'm not here to cheer you up, you prat. What? What are you sitting here moping for? Your best friend just had all of his dreams come true at once. Go and be a good sport. Sirius made an indignant noise, still trying to move away from Remus. There wasn't much space left now. You wouldn't understand, he sniffed. I suppose not, Remus confirmed calmly. But I do understand that James really, really wanted to be a chaser, and he worked really hard for it, and he got it. And Marlene really wanted to be a beater, and she worked really hard for it. Evans told us, so she got it. She was just better than you. Piss off! Sirius gave him a shove, but Remus was used to getting pushed around, and whether Sirius liked it or not, Remus was stronger. You don't even care that much, he continued, pushing back. Not as much as Potter. You only did the trial because he was doing it, but you don't always have to be the same. You still beat him at Transfiguration. You still get the best marks in the year. Everyone likes you. Well, except the Slytherins and maybe your family, but who cares? Peter's family doesn't like him either. Sirius let out a weak little laugh at that, despite himself. Stop acting like a little kid and go and say well done. Fine. Good. They both hopped down from the ledge, pushing the tapestry out of the way. The tiny embroidered knights shook their fists at the boys for disrupting their pursuit of the silver unicorn, which whinnied and galloped into a dense copse of woven trees. They walked back to the common room. Sirius shoved his hands in his pockets. Did you all have breakfast? He asked sulkily. Yep, Remus replied. James saved you some toast, though. He's a good mate, Sirius smiled. Yeah, Remus snapped. He is. They were quiet for a bit longer. Just before they reached the portrait of the fat lady, Sirius looked at Remus. His eyes were still slightly pink, but other than that, he seemed himself again. I don't try to copy James. Didn't say you did, Remus said. You compete, though. Sirius seemed to acknowledge this. He looked up again. And I don't care what my family thinks. He said this so fiercely that his eyes shone, glistening slightly, and Remus was worried he'd start crying again. He reached out and touched Sirius' shoulder, warily, as you might try to calm a growling dog. I know, mate, he said softly. I know that. Chapter 27, Second Year, A Birthday Engagement A note. There are some hom homophobic attitudes and a little homophobic language in this chapter. So full warning for that. Friday, 3rd of November, 1972. Sirius's 13th birthday did not fall on the full moon as his 12th had. He never told the others about the talking to he'd got from Remus, not as far as Remus could tell anyway, but he did act slightly differently toward his friends, whereas before he'd sometimes treated Remus as a bit of a pet project, amazed whenever Lupin exhibited some independent thought, Sirius at least appeared to develop more sensitivity toward the two secondary marauders. The subject of Quidditch was still a sore one, and so on the morning of his second Hogwarts birthday, James had enough tact not to suggest a lunchtime flying session. Breakfast began with a round of happy birthday at the very tops of their voices, as had been tradition for the marauders by now. The Potters sent Sirius a huge basket of chocolates, while James had ordered half of Zonko's catalogue as a birthday present. Remus was a bit embarrassed to hand over his own gifts. Some old copies of Melody Maker and NME that he'd pinched over the summer. But Sirius was thrilled. One of them had an interview with Mark Bolan. They spent most of breakfast turning the pages the three pure-blood wizards laughing at the static muggle photographs. 
Remus kept sneaking looks at Sirius, wondering if he looked any different now that he was a teenager. Remus had wanted to be 13 for ages. It seemed to be a very mature, grand sort of age. He knew it was silly to think you could become imbued with some kind of new wisdom overnight, but it certainly was an important milestone, whichever way you looked at it. Sirius was definitely holding himself in a slightly different way. Remus was sure. Unfortunately, the carefree morning ended there. As they finished their meal and were preparing to get up for their first lesson, History of Magic, their passage to the hall was blocked. Sirius, a stern voice said. Narcissa Black stood before them. At fifteen, she was taller than all four marauders. She was a fairly attractive girl, Remus thought, if a little bit pinched round the face. She didn't have her older sister's mad look and had dyed and straightened her long hair so that it hung in a gorgeous platinum sheet which shimmered when it caught the light. She stood before them with her arms crossed, Regulus skulking at her side. Sissy? Sirius nodded in greeting. She flinched but didn't chastise him. It is your birthday, she said. Well, I am aware. She rolled her eyes. It seemed she didn't have her sister's temper either, which Remus was glad for. You're to eat with us this evening. Come and sit at the Gryffindor table if you absolutely have to. No, she narrowed her grey eyes. Your mother has given strict instructions. We'll eat privately in the Slytherin common room, like last year. No! Sirius lost his newfound maturity and suddenly seemed very much like a child, practically stamping his foot. I want to eat with my friends! You can eat with them any time you want, Narcissa snapped, her hands on her hips now. Birthdays are family occasions. Regulus looked at his feet, still standing just behind his cousin. Sirius was still annoyed, but finally nodded his assent. James placed a hand on his shoulder. A harmless gesture, but Regulus looked up and stared intently, as if they were doing something foul. Once a time had been set for dinner, the two Slytherin blacks left, and the marauders stared after them. James looked at Sirius. Bad luck, he commiserated. Want to bunk off lessons? Nah. Sirius shook his head. I'll just take a few dong bombs with me to dinner. We can see if that time bomb spell works. Perfect. Sirius was gone for a long while after dinner. James paced the dorm room, checking his watch every few minutes and wondering out loud whether he ought to go and stand outside the dungeons and shout. We need to start working on your map again, Lupin, he said, running his hands through his already catastrophic hair. Get everyone tagged so we know where they are at all times. We're a long way off that, Remus replied from his bed where he was reading a book. Still haven't mapped out any of the East Wing. I can do some over Christmas. No, James stopped in the middle of the room. You and Black are coming to mine for Christmas. Remus stared at him and swallowed awkwardly. James, I can't. You know I can't. James waved a hand, resuming his pacing. I'll sort it all out with Dad, don't worry. Full moon's on the 20th, I checked. We can all hang out here until then and leave on the 21st. Remus was speechless, but it didn't matter. James decided quickly after that to don his cloak and go looking for Sirius. Peter, rather predictably, followed him, but Remus was enjoying his book and let them go. He lolled on the bed and thought about putting a record on. James and Peter had called for a ban on Bowie until the end of the year. But if they weren't in the room... At the beginning of the year, Remus had been so taken in by Sirius's excitement he hadn't told him that he'd known all about Ziggy Stardust. In fact, everyone in the Muggle world pretty much had been talking about him all summer. Sometime in mid-July, Remus had sat in the rec room after tea with a few of the older boys to watch Top of the Pops. Their TV was still black and white, but Remus felt as though he'd seen the performance in colour. David Bowie was like no one he'd ever seen before. All of them had sat staring with their mouths wide open as the slender, alien-looking man bopped across the stage in a patchwork leotard. He was as pale as snow. His hair was long at the back and stuck up wildly on top. His eyes were arresting, one pupil larger than the other. He was wearing makeup. Remus had at once wanted to know him and to be him. When David slung his arm round the tall, fair-haired guitarist, Remus's stomach had gone and done an odd sort of flip and as the two men sang in the same microphone, their cheeks pressed close together, one of the St. Edmund's care workers had marched over and turned off the television set. Nasty queers, he'd said. Disgusting putting that sort of thing on telly when kiddies might see it. 
Remus thought about it more than he wanted to. When the two other boys returned, it was with a white-faced Sirius. He looked worse than he usually did after an encounter with his family, closed off and utterly joyless. Even his eyes looked a little less bright, veering into grey. What's up? Remus stood up, concerned. It's terrible, Sirius said. Really, really terrible. Vile. The worst, most unthinkable. Horrific. He threw himself onto his bed face down. He's been like this since we found him in the dungeons, James explained. Nothing but adjectives. Superlative adjectives, Sirius corrected, muffled slightly by his pillow. Yeah, yeah, you're being dramatic, James sighed. He ran his fingers through his hair again. He'd be bald before he saw thirty, Remus thought. Want to tell us why? Sirius rolled onto his back, staring up at the canopy of his bed. I'm getting married. What? James and Peter looked just as shocked as Remus, so at least he knew this wasn't a normal wizard thing. Narcissa told me, he nodded, still staring blankly upward. Usually they wouldn't make a match until I was of age, like Bellatrix, but Sissy says they've decided to tighten the reins in my case. Make a match? James sounded flabbergasted. The blacks don't still have arranged marriages, surely? Of course we do. Sirius heaved a sigh. Noble and most ancient, etc., etc. They want to hold the betrothal ceremony next summer. I'm supposed to buck my ideas up in time for it. Then the wedding is happening as soon as I finish Hogwarts. Doubt you lot will be invited. That's mad! That's medieval! That's... My mother, Sirius finished. Um... Remus felt rude interrupting, but his curiosity was getting the better of him. Who are you supposed to be marrying? Sirius sat up. That's the twist in the dragon's tail, isn't it? He said angrily. That's my mother's pièce de résistance. He pronounced the French beautifully with a perfect accent. <laughs> Even in his darkest rages, Sirius Black could enunciate. Who? Sissy. What? Narcissa. Your cousin? Narcissa Black? Sirius nodded. His shoulders sagged. The closed-off look returned to his face and he lay back down. Apparently they're looking to rein her in too. Andromeda, her sister, you know, the normal one? She's pregnant, according to Sissy. They're closing ranks, trying to prevent any more dirty blood getting in. But surely there have to be other pure blood girls out there, James reasoned. And I thought she and that Malfoy creep were going out. They are, Sirius nodded. She's as pissed off about it as I am, believe me. Talk about wedded bliss. What about Regulus? James was asking. He looked as though his mind were working a mile a minute. What about him? Sirius said bitterly. Think he fancies her instead? She's quite pretty, Peter said meekly. Sirius gave him a look that could shatter glass. She's my cousin, you dolt! All right, James held up an authoritative hand. No need for name-calling, we're just trying to help. Remus couldn't see exactly how Peter was helping, but he bit his tongue and let James continue. I meant, did Regulus say anything? He was there, wasn't he? Not a word. Sirius glowered and no one mentioned his brother again. Right, well... James pushed his glasses up his nose. We've got till next summer, and we've got Narcissa on our side, believe it or not, so I'd say it's not hopeless. You don't know what hopeless is until you've met my mother, Sirius said. And she doesn't know what a marauder is, James said firmly. Gentlemen? He looked at each of them in turn. Remus could see exactly what was coming. We have a new mission. Chapter 28. Second Year. Assumptions. How on earth could you get yourself out of an engagement? Remus wondered to himself as he made his way down to the dungeons on Sunday evening. He was alone. Lily had asked him to check on the potion they were working on one more time before handing it in the next day. He personally thought it was overkill, but was also guiltily aware that Evans had so far done the lion's share of the work. 
Sirius's problem had been ticking away in the back of his mind all day. James had charged them all with coming up with solution by Christmas, but Remus couldn't see what might be done. He'd never thought about engagement or marriage or even family before. Those were all grown-up things. Thirteen-year-old boys certainly weren't supposed to worry about them. But then, he supposed, turning the final bend in the staircase. Nor were twelve-year-old boys supposed to worry about transforming into monsters once a month. He sighed heavily, pushing the door to the potions classroom open. To his disgust, Severus Snape was in there already, stirring his own potion. Their eyes met, and Remus froze for a moment before squaring his shoulders, raising his chin and walking straight over to his own cauldron, choosing to ignore the other boy. But he couldn't help but notice that his potion was a slightly different colour from Snape's, which couldn't be a good sign. Theirs was a bold royal blue, much darker than it ought to be. Snape had obviously noticed too. "'You need to add more lavender,' he said nasally, not looking up from his stirring. At least another teaspoon. Yeah, right, Remus frowned. As if I'm going to take advice off you. I'm hardly going to ruin Lily's potion, am I? Snape spat back. Remus considered this. It was true that despite Severus's genuinely unpleasant demeanour, the only other thing the marauders knew about him was that he'd do almost anything for Lily Evans. It was weird, but Remus wasn't one to judge anyone for being weird. He spooned in some more lavender and stirred. At once the potion took on a paler sky-blue hue, and a lovely dreamy aroma rose from it. Snape made a smug clicking noise with his tongue, and closed the lid on his own cauldron, getting ready to leave. "'Hiya, Sev!' a voice came from the doorway. "'Oh, Remus!' It was Lily. She looked a little embarrassed. Remus frowned. "'Thought we agreed I was checking it tonight.' "'Um, yes, we did. I was just—' Double-checking. Her pale cheeks were bright red. Didn't think I'd show up. Snape snorted derisively on his way out. Remus fought the urge to throw a spoon at the back of his greasy head. Lily didn't notice. She'd already crossed the room and was looking down into the cauldron. Well, you get a lot of detentions, she said diplomatically. Severus swept out of the room. Oh, well, it looks much better than it did this morning. Did you do something? Added more lavender. Really? Nice one. It looks exactly right now. Well, he rubbed the back of his head, glancing that the door was shut. Snape was out of earshot. Yeah, I just thought it needed some, I suppose. Nothing left to do, then. Are you on your way back to the common room? Yeah. They walked together. Lily was in a good mood. We work quite well together, don't we? She smiled at him. It's a nice change from Sev, anyway. You're much more easygoing. Remus had never thought of himself as easygoing before. It was a nice thing for her to say, but then, compared to Snape, anyone might seem more relaxed. What's the thing with you and him, anyway? he asked. He's my best friend, Lily answered promptly, as if she had to justify this all the time. We've known each other ages. Oh, right. He's not as bad as you think he is she said, glancing at him sideways. He can be really kind. And funny. Why does he hang out with Mulciber and the pureblood lot, then? Well, if we're going to base our assumptions on people based on their friends... Lily looked at him very pointedly. What's wrong with my friends? Remus was shocked. Everyone loved James and Sirius. Lily rolled their eyes. They're all heirs to pureblood houses, aren't they? She tossed her auburn curls. Plus they're massive show-offs. Potter thinks he's God's gift and Black... Well, he's a Black, isn't he? Even I know about them and I'm muggle-born. I suppose Peter's okay, but it's sad the way he follows them round everywhere. I follow them round too. Yeah, you do. She looked at him again cheekily. You're wrong about them, Remus said. I mean, okay, you're right about them showing off, but they're not just... There's more to them. Well, then you'll just have to accept that there's more to Severus, won't you? She was harder to argue with than Sirius. Remus shrugged noncommittally. It occurred to him that Lily might be able to help with their present conundrum. After all, weddings and engagements were girl things, weren't they? At least she might offer another perspective. Evans, he said thoughtfully, you're quite clever. Oh, cheers very much. Sorry, I mean you're cleverer than me. Much better.
He grinned, rubbing the back of his head. What would you do if your family was making you marry someone you didn't want to? She frowned as if that was not at all what she expected. Like an arranged marriage? I thought you lived in a foster home. A children's home, he corrected. They're different. Anyway, it's not me, it's someone else. Hmm. She looked stumped, which didn't give Remus much hope. Gosh, I, I mean, it's not something my parents would ever do. But if they did, I'd be really angry, obviously. And hurt. Hurt? he asked, puzzled. Well, obviously. Your parents are supposed to love you and want what's best for you. Making a decision like that on your behalf is the complete opposite. Right, he nodded, though he really didn't understand. Well, um, this person doesn't really get on with their parents anyway. Even so, Lily shrugged. That doesn't mean they're not hurt by it. You should be able to trust the people who raised you. Oh, okay. Remus didn't know what to say to that. He had a horrible churning sensation in his stomach, the same feeling he used to get when called upon to read aloud. Lily hadn't noticed. They were almost at the common room now. I still don't know what I'd do, she sighed. It's like the only option is to defy them, the parents, but that's going to cause all sorts of problems. Who's this about? Go on, tell me. Remus shook his head. Can't. Sorry. Lily nodded, understanding. Remus smiled at her. She had an immensely soothing presence. Flippity gibbet, Lily said to the portrait, which swung open for them to crawl through. James had not long returned from Quidditch practice and was still in his red flying robes. He sat on one of the sofas, flicking Zonko's bursting beans into the fireplace, where they burst into a riot of colour like miniature fireworks. Sirius lay on the rug beneath him, reading a book on hexes he'd brought from home. All right, Lupin. James grinned. Remus nodded to Lily and went over to his friends. The redhead went straight up the stairs to the girls' dorm. "'Dumped us for Evans, have you?' James asked, smirking. "'Potions,' Remus replied. "'Right, you're friends with her now?' "'Sort of,' Remus shrugged. "'She's all right. She hates you two. "'What?' They both sat up, looking affronted. "'But everyone likes us,' Sirius said. "'The lovable rogues!' She thinks you're show-offs, James gasped dramatically. How dare she? We'll have to win her over. I bother, Sirius rolled over, returning to his book. She's friends with Snivellus. She clearly has no taste. Did she really say that? James was asking Remus. He nodded. She said you think you're God's gift. What does that mean? It's a muggle expression, Remus explained. Means she thinks you're full of yourself. She thinks that. Well, Remus looked at him. You sort of are, to be honest. James laughed. Remus sat beside him, grabbed a handful of the Zonko beans himself, and flinging them into the fire one by one. He and James shortly made a game of it, seeking who could create the biggest explosion by hitting the embers just right. Forgot to say, James said, once the bag of beans was empty. Got the owl from Dad today. He's spoken to McGonagall and got permission for us to have you over Christmas. What? Really? Remus was fascinated. Why would a grown-up who'd never met him before want to intervene on his behalf? He made a mental note never to underestimate the power of James's will ever again. Yeah, doesn't think he could get you for the summer, though. Sorry. Remus shook his head wordlessly. He ought to say thank you, but he hardly knew how. Just waiting for you now, mate. James nudged Sirius with his foot. Have you sorted it out with your mum? Say you're going to the Pettigrews again. Not bothering, Sirius replied, still reading. Just going to go to yours without saying anything. Sirius was rarely, if ever, in contact with his parents, but since the Narcissa development, he'd been ignoring their owls altogether. Remus wasn't sure the silence was the best way for Sirius to express his discontent, but as Lily had just reminded him, Remus knew very little about families. Mum won't like it, James chewed his lip. Don't tell her, then. Sirius turned his page. James and Remus exchanged a look. They had to do something about the engagement soon. The thought of Sirius being in this mood for five more years was a very grim one indeed. Chapter 29 Second Year December Moon <laughs> 
The Hogwarts Express left Hogsmeade Station for Christmas on Saturday, 16th of December that year, meaning that once the full moon had passed, James, Sirius and Remus had to find other means of getting to the Potter's family home. McGonagall, after lecturing Remus on not letting any other students in on his secret, was sympathetic to the Marauder's wishes and allowed them to use the flu connection in her office just this once. Remus didn't mind the lecture so much, but he was terrified of using the flu network for the first time. He'd heard all sorts of horror stories from his fellow students, and it didn't help that he was usually queasy for a few days after the full moon anyway. Sirius received a howler every morning after the 16th, demanding that he come home at once, but he simply tossed the scarlet envelopes into the fireplace, where Walpurga black screams echoed up into the chimney stacks. James was clearly unnerved by this behaviour, but didn't say anything. Sirius was always up for a fight lately, and it was just better to steer clear. Unfortunately, as the full moon drew nearer, Remus also had a very short fuse. The two boys bickered over everything and anything, and poor James had to step between the pair more than once. "'Just write her back, for God's sake!' Remus groaned on the morning of the 20th, throwing a pillow at Sirius from his bed. He'd been woken early for the third morning in a row by a howler. "'If you think you can escape your birthright in this cowardly fashion, then you have another thing coming!' it wailed, echoing through Gryffindor Tower like a banshee. "'Stay out of it, Lupin!' Sirius flung the pillow back at him. "'How am I supposed to stay out of it when it's in our bloody bedroom every morning?' Remus growled, getting up now. "'I'm so sorry to inconvenience you!' Sirius retorted, dripping with sarcasm. He looked rough, as if he hadn't slept properly at all, but Remus was in too much of a bad mood to care, and his transformation was only hours away. "'How about not acting like a spoiled brat for five minutes?' he snapped. "'You're so bloody selfish!' "'I'm not asking her to send them. At least I actually get post. At least some people care enough about me to—' Remus threw himself on top of Sirius and began thumping him hard as he could, incandescent with rage. "'Shut up!' he grunted, landing a decent punch right on Sirius's left cheek. Sirius, though extremely adept at caustic insults, was not much of a fighter. He gasped and tried to push Remus away, eventually grabbing for his wand. Mordio, he hissed, aiming at Remus's face. At once Remus let go, tumbling backwards onto the bed, clutching his forehead. A horrible stinging sensation radiated from the spot Sirius had cursed. You wanker, he yelled, feeling his face tightening and swelling up. You deserved it. Sirius! James had clambered out of bed too late. You cursed him? You bloody cursed him? Sirius was looking less sure of himself now. He started it. He didn't even have his wand on him. Remus had climbed off the bed and was staring at himself in the wardrobe mirror. He looked as though he'd rolled through a stinging nettle bush backwards. His skin was red and shiny, taut and swelling at a worrying rate. Does it hurt? James asked tentatively. Remus shook his head, though it did, a lot. I'm going to the hospital wing, he said. Don't come with me, he snapped, seeing James pulling on his dressing gown. As he marched out of the room still in his pyjamas, he heard James mutter, Attacking someone who's unarmed is really fucking low, Black. Madame Pomfrey healed him quickly using the counter jinx, but she was very annoyed about it. Who did it? she asked him. If it was Potter or Black, then I want to hear about it. I told Minerva it was a bad idea to let you go away for Christmas. Why shouldn't I go? Remus asked, scandalised. Sirius is going. Mr Black doesn't have your limitations. But we're not going till tomorrow. It's right after the full moon. That's the safest... I'm thinking of your health, Remus. You're very fragile. I am not fragile, Remus seethed. Of course not, dear, she said, not really listening to him. Now sit there quietly for a bit, eh? Have you had breakfast? Madame Pomfrey made him stay in the hospital wing all day in his pyjamas. The Mediwitch had been working on a new potion that she hoped might make his transformation smoother. She let him borrow some of her books so it wasn't too bad, but he felt like an invalid all the same. His face was still a bit stinging from Sirius's curse, though the swelling had gone down substantially.
It might be a good one to use on Snape. He made a mental note to remember to ask Sirius exactly how he'd done it. At about one o'clock, just after lunch, James and Sirius came to see him. Madame Pomfrey gave them a sound telling off first. Cursing your fellow housemate! Cursing your dorm mate, for goodness sake! In my day, you'd been flogged, and Professor McGonagall has informed me that you know about his special circumstances. One might think you'd have more sense! James made copious apologies, and Sirius, who barely flinched at his mother's obscene chastisements any more, hung his head, looking utterly ashamed. Eventually, Remus guessed that this must have been enough to satisfy the school nurse, who allowed them over to see him. They stood at the end of the bed like mourners, barely meeting his eye. "'We're really sorry, Remus,' James started. Remus clicked his tongue. "'You never did anything.' James kicked Sirius, who looked up too. "'I'm really sorry, Remus.' He had a heavy dark bruise high on his left cheek, and his eyes looked a little over-bright. Remus wondered if Sirius had cried about it. The thought made him feel funny. He shook his head, no longer angry. "'I started it. Sorry I hit you. Sorry about the howler. Sorry your mum's a nightmare. Sorry you're a werewolf.' They both laughed, and everything was forgiven. "'Will she let you out now?' James asked. "'Few hours still to the moon.' Remus shook his head. "'Now she wants to try some new potion.' "'I didn't know there was a cure.' "'There isn't,' Remus said quickly. "'This is just a, uh... "'I think it's to make the transformation, you know, easier.' They both looked at him, puzzled. He shifted uncomfortably. "'Like a painkiller, I think.' Muggle ones don't work. Does it hurt, then? Sirius asked, cocking his head. Now that the storm had passed, he was back to seeing Remus as an interesting specimen. Well, yeah, Remus frowned. He'd assumed they knew a lot more than him, having grown up in the wizarding world, so he was surprised that they didn't know about the pain. For a long time, the pain was the only thing he'd known. To his surprise and delight, James and Sirius elected to stay in the hospital wing with Remus for the rest of the afternoon. They played a few riotous games of exploding snap before Madame Pomfrey sternly told them to quiet down, so they switched to gobstones. As the evening drew in, they didn't go down for dinner, but ate the same hospital food he did. There was no great thing for them. James and Sirius treated it as any other afternoon. The hospital bed was just an extension of their dorm. For Remus, it was everything. It was time that would otherwise be spent anxious and alone. It was the closest thing to family he could imagine. McGonagall came and chased them out eventually, ready to lead Remus to the shack. He went peacefully, with a soft smile on his lips and laughter still echoing in his ears. Madame Pomfrey's pain-killing potion had no effect, but Remus found the transformation slightly more tolerable all the same. James and Sirius arrived first thing the next morning. Remus was dozing in his bed, having been brought back into the castle at dawn. His face hurt, and he knew it wasn't from the curse any more. Madame Pomfrey had left a hand mirror on his bedside table, glass down, but he'd been too tired to look yet. He was woken by the sharp gasp of breath that came from either James or Sirius. He wasn't sure who. When he opened his eyes, they both rearranged their expressions into stoic cheer. "'All right, mate,' James said with a half-smile, as you might address a child. Right, Remus croaked, hauling himself up. It must be bad. He lifted the heavy mirror and turned it toward his face. Ah. The cut looked half-healed already, thanks to Pomfrey's ministrations, but it was still a shock. The scab was hard and black, edged with tender red skin. It stretched from the corner of one eye, up over the bridge of his nose, diagonally toward the centre of his opposite cheek. He couldn't remember much, but it looked as though he'd almost split his face wide open. "'My beautiful face,' he said weakly, attempting sarcasm, but feeling dreadful. Now everyone would know. So far, he'd been able to hide the worst of his scars under his robes, but he knew now that it had only been a matter of time before his luck ran out in that regard. "'It's not that bad,' James said quickly. "'It'll heal really fast, I bet.' "'How did—' Sirius began, but was interrupted by Madame Pomfrey, who came storming over. "'You two back again!' They stepped back sharply, as if frightened of her, showing deference they never showed for McGonagall. 
the nurse pulled the curtain around Remus's bed, closing it in their faces. "'Ah, you've had a look, have you?' She addressed Remus now in a much softer tone. "'I know it looks bad, but it'll pale just like the others. Should be barely noticeable by the new year.' Remus somehow didn't believe her. Even his most faded scars were still very noticeable. She took a closer look, then smoothed a clear ointment over the cut. "'Take this with you,' she instructed, handing him the jar. "'Apply every morning and evening. Does it hurt still?' He shook his head. She clucked her tongue sceptically. "'Well, even so, it might itch a bit as it heals. Perhaps we could try trimming your nails down next month, though I suppose the claws would come in anyway. <sighs> she sighed, sounding frustrated. "'Your face must have been irritated even after we got the swelling down.' "'It's fine,' Remus shrugged her off. He was keenly aware of his friends on the other side of the curtain and wanted her to go away. "'Can I go now? I feel okay. "'Wouldn't you rather get a bit more sleep?' "'No,' he shook his head vehemently. "'I'm hungry. I want to go down for breakfast.' He knew that would work. She was always on him to eat more. "'Well, fine. Get dressed and off you pop.' Sirius was very quiet during breakfast, leaving James and Remus to maintain the conversation, something neither of them had much practice at by themselves. Once fed, they went upstairs to pack because Sirius and Remus had left it to the last minute. James, frustrated by their lack of foresight, marched to McGonagall's office to see if everything was ready for their journey, leaving them to it. Remus packed a few things. He hadn't got the others any presents, and he made them all promise not to get him anything either. It wasn't fair. Matron had sent ahead a small package, so there was that. He threw in some clothes. The others probably wore robes at home, but the only robes Remus owned were his school uniform, and he wasn't very sure he actually owned that, or whether it was just on loan, so he just shoved in his muggle clothes. Packed, Remus turned to find Sirius standing directly behind him, looking even worse than he had the day before. "'What's up?' Remus asked, startled. "'It's my fault.' Sirius replied, his voice strangely flat. I heard Pomfrey say so. Huh? Your face. I cursed it. Then when you turned, you scratched it. Oh! Remus raised his fingers to his face self-consciously. Sirius looked away. It's not really your fault, Remus said awkwardly. I mean, I scratch everywhere else, too. Bound to happen eventually. Why do you do it? Sirius had asked that once before when looking at his old scars. This time Remus could tell that he really understood what he was asking, but Remus still didn't have an answer. I don't know. I don't remember. You don't remember anything at all? Not really. I know I'm always hungry, like I've been starving all my life, and angry. About what? Remus shook his head. Just angry. I'm so sorry, Remus. Sirius looked sad again. Remus couldn't bear it. Oh, shut up, he said, half-joking. You wouldn't think twice about cursing James or Peter. Yeah, but you're... Don't say it. He'd been afraid this might happen. Please don't treat me like I'm sick or different or whatever. It's one night a month. If I punch you, you're allowed to curse me, okay? Sirius looked like he wanted to laugh. Are you saying you're planning to punch me again? Remus threw a sock at him. If you don't sort out those bastard howlers, maybe. Travelling by flu powder was nothing compared to feeling your own spine elongate every month, and Remus wasn't sure what all the fuss had been about. He was the second to step out of the fireplace into the potter's lounge, after James. Brushing soot from his shoulders, he quickly hopped off the hearth rug to make room for Sirius, and watched as James was pulled into a hearty embrace by both his parents. Mr. and Mrs. Potter were quite a bit older than Remus had imagined, but both had kind, merry faces that shared familiar features with their son. Mr. Potter's hair was white as snow, but stuck up at every angle exactly like James's. Mrs. Potter had his winning smile and warm hazel eyes, they both hugged Sirius, too, while Remus shrank back, feeling horribly out of place. Finally, Mrs. Potter turned her sunny smile on him. Thankfully, she did not make to hug him, too, perhaps sensing that he was uncomfortable. She simply nodded at him gently. 
Hello, Remus. We've heard so much about you. I'm so glad you're spending Christmas with us. Remus smiled back shyly, but couldn't bring himself to speak. It didn't matter. James and Sirius were chattering nineteen to the dozen with Mr. Potter, who looked like a schoolboy himself, eyes twinkling with fun and mischief. The sitting room, Remus supposed it was a sitting room, as it had three sofas in it, was the biggest he'd ever seen, with wide, tall windows letting in soft winter sunlight that pooled onto the polished hardwood floors. A gigantic Christmas tree stood in one corner, glimmering with silver dust and surrounded by a mountain of brightly wrapped presents. Paper chains and streamers were draped across the ceiling and along the picture rails, and even the magical portraits had decorated their frames with fairy lights. As they were led through the house, "'For goodness sakes, Fleamont, let the boys put their things away before you start planning whatever it is I know you're planning.' He found that every room, even the hallways, were decorated with lights, tinsel, and hundreds and hundreds of festive cards. The potters must be very popular wizards indeed. They were certainly wealthy. The sweeping mahogany staircase continued up three more flights. James's bedroom was big enough for all three of them, bigger than their dorm room at Hogwarts with a king-size four-poster bed, but Remus was surprised to find that there were four equally large bedrooms which were unoccupied. Sirius had already claimed the one next to James, so Remus put his bag in the third room, wondering what it would be like to sleep alone for the first time. "'Come on then, lads!' Mr. Potter yelled up the stairs in a booming voice. It's been snowing all afternoon, and I've got the toboggans ready. Chapter 30. Second Year. Christmas with the Potters. Remus had thought that nothing could be much better than Christmas at Hogwarts, which was, quite literally, magical. Christmas at the Potters, however, was an entirely different experience that seemed to only get better. First, there was tobogganing down the snowy slopes in the back garden, though at over 500 acres, no one could really call it a garden. Peter, who lived further down in the main village, came out to join them as soon as he heard they'd arrived, and they had an extremely noisy and violent afternoon, careening down the hillsides and playing complex war games with snowball ammunition. Mr. Potter even joined in, sprightly for his age and with considerable advantage of being able to use magic. Mrs. Potter called them in for lunch and made them all change out of their freezing wet clothes, they sat by the fireplace, warm and dry, eating hot toasted tea cake smeared with rich yellow butter. In the afternoon they wanted to go out again, but Mr. Potter had gone to lie down, and Mrs. Potter didn't want them to go out so close to nightfall. Instead they helped her decorate an enormous Christmas cake with white royal icing and tiny magical figurines, then to wrap presents for the neighbours and their house elves. "'We never got anything for our house elf,' Sirius said matter-of-factly, his fingers hopelessly bound in some spello tape. Mind you, creatures are moody git. I doubt he wants anything. They'll take gifts as long as it's something edible, I find, Mrs. Potter replied, smiling. No clothes, of course. That only upsets them. Tell Mum what your lot does to house elves, Sirius, James grinned, binding his friend's hands up even more. Sirius laughed lightly. Mounts their heads, he said, once they're dead. At least, I think we wait until they're dead. Creature's the only house elf I remember. Goodness, said Mrs. Potter. I'd rather thought that tradition had died out. Not with the blacks, Sirius sighed. Remus could tell that he was thinking about the betrothal again. You're making a lovely job of that, Remus, Mrs. Potter observed, glancing over at the book he was wrapping for Mrs. Pettigrew. Unlike some naughty boys I could mention... She turned a stern gaze upon her son and his best friend, now attempting to tape their hands to the tabletop. Remus smiled at her politely, feeling the fresh cotton his face pull at his skin. He still hadn't really said anything to either of James's parents. He'd always been told to be seen and not heard by older people, and he'd never been to a friend's house before. Sirius, by contrast, was completely at ease. Remus had never seen him happier. He doted on Mrs. Potter as if she was his own mother— if he liked his own mother, of course. Remus yawned more widely than he meant to, trying to hide behind his hands, ducking his head embarrassed. He'd only slept a few hours that morning following the moon, and an afternoon of snowball manoeuvres had left him exhausted. "'You'd better go up to bed, dear,' Mrs. Potter said, ignoring the fact that it was only three o'clock in the afternoon. Remus wondered if James had told his parents about him. They must know. McGonagall might not have let him come otherwise.' 
Oh, you're all right, aren't you, Lupin? Sirius cajoled. Peter's coming back in a bit so we can go out again. Remus blinked at him, then looked at James for help. Leave him alone, Sirius, Mrs. Potter chided. The poor boy's dead on his feet. Come on, off you go, dear. Gratefully, Remus got up from the kitchen table and made his way to bed. As he changed into his night things, he couldn't help but steal another glance at himself in the mirror, now that he was properly alone. Perhaps it was having been out in the cold, but the scar looked worse than it had that morning, the contrast harsher with his pale skin. Would his face always surprise him now? Would he catch a glimpse of himself in some mirror or shining surface and jump? Would people be afraid of him? There was a soft tap at the door just as Remus was about to put the ointment Madame Pomfrey had given him. It was serious. Remus caught his scent even before he knocked. All right. The dark-haired boy crept inside, speaking quietly. He held a pewter goblet in his hand. James's mum sent you this. It's a healing draught, I think. Oh, thanks, Remus said tiredly. Sirius set it down on the bedside table. You okay? Fine. Just tired, mate. We were... Were we too, you know, rough or something? No, Remus said, very firmly, probably sounding angrier than he meant to. It's nothing to do with you two, it's just the fact that I was up all night howling at the bloody moon and trying to rip my own face off. I'm tired. Remus had to sit down. The effort of the outburst made him dizzy. Sorry, Sirius said more quietly. It was the second time he'd apologised that day, and Remus hated the sound of it. I'll leave you. He closed the door. Remus couldn't bring himself to start worrying about hurting Sirius's feelings. He smeared on some of the ointment, then sniffed the goblet Mrs. Potter had sent. He recognised it as something he'd had before at Hogwarts, which would trigger instant sleep. Getting into bed, he drained it quickly and closed his eyes. The remaining days before Christmas passed quickly, and Remus was able to experience real family life for the first time. Mr. and Mrs. Potter had to be the perfect parents. They were kind and sure, always smiling and full of fun, Remus hadn't known that adults could be that way. He hadn't known that people could grow up like that. And it was clearer than ever why James was the way he was, as brimming with love and blind confidence as Remus was brimming with rage. It was obvious, too, why Sirius was so drawn to the family. He had an unquenchable thirst for love, and the Potters had an endless supply. The boys tramped all over the surrounding countryside in the snow, bundled up in their warm Gryffindor scarves, hats and gloves, in the evenings they played card games, helped Mrs. Potter prepare dinner, and listened to Mr. Potter tell ghost stories around the fireplace. They made mince pies and paper chains. They built snow wizards and igloos, and they slept so soundly in their beds at night that not even a howler could have woken them. Unfortunately, it was not to last. When the blacks had stopped sending howlers, they had not forgotten their wayward son and tried a new tact on Christmas Eve, with devastating consequences for the marauders. They were drinking warm butterbeer and sitting on the hearth rug. James and Sirius were playing gobstones very loudly, and Mr. Potter was teaching Remus to play chess. The old man had been horrified that Remus didn't know how, and Remus was surprised to find himself actually quite enjoying the game. The whole room felt warm and safe, heavy curtains drawn against the cold and dark, tree lights twinkling softly and the fire popping and crackling beside them. The clock had just struck nine, and Mrs. Potter was keen to send them all to bed, but there was a loud crack outside the window. Mr. and Mrs. Potter shared a quick glance, and Remus's ears pricked like a dog. The smell of spent magic permeated the air like burnt toast, something dark and unsavoury. There was a firm, hollow knock at the door. We weren't expecting anyone, were we, Effie? Mr. Potter frowned slightly at his wife. She shook her head, and they both listened. The Potter's house-elf, Gully, went scampering toward the front door to open it. There were stilted voices in the hall, and Gully came hurrying in. Oh, Mr. Potter! Mr. Potter! She's come for young Master Black! She's telling me she's his mother! I told them to wait there for you! The elf was wringing his hands anxiously, very clearly confused by this turn of events. Sirius and James looked at each other. Sirius's face was white. He looked like he might be sick. She wouldn't, he whispered. Mr. Potter was already up and out the door. There were raised voices in the hallway now. Remus recognised Mrs. Black's sharp tone from her horrid letters. Serious? Mrs. Potter said gently. 
Did your parents give you permission to visit us, dear? He looked at the floor. She clucked her tongue. Oh, sweetheart, she said, sounding very sad. Don't make him leave, Mum, James stood up. He hates them. They're his parents, James. Sirius, Mr. Potter called from the hall. Sirius got up. James did, too. Remus didn't want to. He wanted to stay by the fire, where they'd all been so happy just moments beforehand. But Mrs. Potter had stood up, too, and this was just one of those times where the marauders had to present a united front, no matter how frightening Sirius's mother was. They all filed out into the hall. Remus had seen Mrs. Black once before, the first time he'd boarded the Hogwarts Express. Back then, he merely thought she looked very severe, and that she looked like Sirius. She still looked severe. Her hair was slicked back and pulled up in a tight bun, which coiled like a serpent at the crown of her head, fixed with an emerald pin. Her eyes were dark, not as blue as Sirius's, but she had that black family bone structure and superior look. She was shorter than Mr. Potter, but still managed to gaze at him as though he were filth on the bottom of her boot. She, her look sharpened as she saw James and Remus appear. Sirius, she said coldly, narrowing her eyes at her eldest son. You come with me at once, creature! She snapped her fingers and an old, wizened-looking house-elf emerged from her robes. Go upstairs and fetch Master Black's things! The house-elf bowed deeply, kissing the silvered cap toes of Mrs. Black's pointed boots and scurrying upstairs. "'Good evening, Walperga, Mrs. Potter said pleasantly, as if there were no tension at all. "'May I offer you a drink? We were just about to crack out the mince pies, weren't we, boys?' Mrs. Black ignored her, staring straight at Sirius. "'Put on your cloak. We're leaving now.' "'But, Mother, I—' "'Don't you dare speak to me,' she hissed, eyes flashing. Remus wanted to run away. She was worse than Matron one hundred times over. She was worse than Bellatrix and Snape and every other nasty person he'd ever met. The thought of letting Sirius go with her made his insides twist. Mr. and Mrs. Potter seemed to be suffering from the same crisis. Well, Perga, why not let him stay? Mrs. Potter tried. I know he's been a bit naughty, but there's no harm done. We can have him for lunch and send him back before dinner tomorrow. They've all been having such a nice time together. Mrs. Black let out a short, crackling laugh, as if her son's enjoyment was the least of her concerns. She eyed James, her gaze raking over his mess of hair, then Remus, staring pointedly at his new scar. Remus looked at his feet, terrified. She'd know. She'd know straight away. Creature came scuttling back down the stairs, followed by a very affronted-looking gully. Sirius's trunk hovered behind them, apparently packed and ready to go. Come along, Sirius. No, he said quietly, but very firmly. Remus wanted to tell him to shut up. Couldn't he see how much trouble he was in? But Sirius was clenching his fists, looking up at his mother. I want to stay here, with the Potters. You can't make me... Silencio! Walpurga spun around, jabbing her wand at Sirius. He stopped speaking at once, though not voluntarily. He opened and closed his mouth a few times, and nothing came out. She'd stolen his voice. Walpurga, really? Mr. Potter gasped, as Mrs. Potter let out a small shriek and knelt beside Sirius, wrapping her arms round him protectively. He's just a boy! He's my son! Walpurga purred, looking daggers at Mrs. Potter. And he is heir to the finest house in Britain. He will learn his place. Come! Sirius. Sirius looked completely defeated, his mouth a straight line of resignation. He hugged Mrs. Potter back, then stepped away from her. He gave James and Remus a small wave before following his mother out the door. The four of them stood in silence after the front door slammed. Remus wondered if James felt as ashamed as he did. Ought they have stood up for their friend in some kind of way? What would happen to him now? Mr. Potter looked furious. Using a silence, silency charm on her own son, on an underage wizard. It's morally reprehensible. She does worse than that, James said quietly. Remus nodded in agreement, feeling as though someone had taken his own power of speech. We'll have to make the house unplottable, Fleamont, Mrs. Potter said suddenly. Make it so he can't be found. 
You said you were considering it after the last election. I don't want that dreadful woman in my house ever again. Mr. Potter nodded darkly. I'll look into it in the new year. Alistair Moody owes me a favour. Bedtime, boys, Mrs. Potter said, her voice trembling. Try not to worry too much. She hugged James fiercely, kissing him on each cheek. Remus tried to dodge her, but she grabbed him too, pulling him into a tight embrace. She smelled like orange and clove. Psst! Remus! Remus had just finished brushing his teeth and was making his way down the hall to his room when James poked his head out and ushered him into his own bedroom. They knelt on the bed together. James withdrew a note from his pyjama pocket. Regulus sent this. What does it say? Remus asked quickly before James could give it to him to read. Oh, um, it says, Sirius is home. Do not try to contact him. That's all? That's all. James nodded grimly. Nice of Regulus, Remus remarked, looking down at the note, which was obviously very hastily scribbled down. Thought they hated each other. Yeah, well, they're still brothers, aren't they? James replied, shrugging. Family ties and all that. Do you think he'll be okay? I don't know. James chewed his lip. I never got to give him his present. He said he never gets anything Christmassy from his lot, just family heirlooms and stuff. I had a go at him the other day, Remus sighed dolefully. You know, about my furry little problem? James chuckled. Don't worry about it. You two are always having a go at each other about something. Just your personalities. Oh, do you think? Remus was a bit miffed by that observation. Sirius snapped at Peter far more often, surely. James grinned. I told you, don't worry about it. Black loves an argument. Christmas morning was a subdued affair, though the Potters were keen to make it cheerful, if only for Remus. He was embarrassed to find a bulging stocking at the foot of his bed when he woke up, and resolved to correct this next year somehow. There were the customary socks and underpants from Matron, plus a tin of shortbread, some chocolate frogs from Peter, and a big book of advanced charms from Sirius. James had bought him a book too. Conjurer's Cartography, a guide to magical map-making. Mr. and Mrs. Potter, however, had gone above and beyond. Under the tree, he found more sweets, practical jokes, a beautiful set of quills, which he tried to give back. We got the same for James and Sirius, dear, don't be silly. And a brand new pair of pyjamas. The Potter's extended family began arriving for Christmas lunch about midday, as well as the Pettigrews, who brought with them Peter's elder sister, Philomena, and her muggle boyfriend she brought back from university. Remus was introduced to everyone as a friend of James's, and generally ignored, except for one tiny and ancient wizard who was already red-nosed and merry from all the drinks Gully was passing round. Lupin, you say? Not Lyle Lupin's boy! Remus gaped, unable to answer. He'd only heard his father's name spoken once or twice. <clears throat> um, yes, he said, finally, blushing hard. Is it here? The wizard grinned, looking round. Excellent fellow. I haven't seen him in years. Um, he's dead, Remus replied with an apologetic shrug. Damn shame, the wizard cried, spilling some of his drink. Fine doula taught me everything I know about bogarts. Temper did tend to get him into trouble, though. I told him not to mess about with that greyback chap. Bloody werewolves ought to exterminate a lot of them. Remus blinked. James looked at him curiously. Fortunately, Mr. Potter intervened. Darius, have another drink, old man. Leave the young people to their games, eh? Remus swallowed hard and returned to the Gobstones tournament as if nothing had happened. <laughs>